in these socially distant times, isn't it great to come together again, Nazlan? Yes, thanks to COVID-19, we are meeting secretly in some unknown coffee shop slash bookstore in downtown Izmir. We can't have coffee, but at least can talk face to face among lots of books. This is the Turkish Coffee Podcast by Nazlan Ertan and Aygen Aytouch, two witty women who have been friends for decades as they traveled and worked all over the world. Actually, we have been recording our conversations on life, culture, social issues, politics, women, men, and especially on peculiarities in Turkey for the last two months. Since Turkish coffee was involved all the time, we call those conversations Turkish coffee podcasts. And we have had people who enjoyed this conversation from Finland to South Africa, from Indonesia to Canada. Now we are rather excited to reach out to new listeners through Duvar English. So what are we going to discuss today then? Something you and I both love. Well, food, something we all love and touch many aspects of our lives, from overall economy to the privacy of our homes and from the chef's table to newspaper headlines. And foreigners who come to Turkey are told that they will have a great culinary experience with healthy, delicious and cheap food. Given the abundant use of pesticides and ever-rising prices, is that still true or just a myth? Starting from the headlines, for the last one month, Turkey saw some of the highest food price increase among countries in the OECD, with an overall food cost rise of more than 20% in the last year. Various surveys in Turkey found that families have started changing their shopping habits because they could no longer afford to buy meat or even vegetables. A mock photo on Twitter showed a man on a bent knee offering a woman some cooking oil instead of a diamond ring. In Turkish, when we refer to what food people eat, we used to say peynir, zeytin, ekmek, meaning bread, cheese and olives. But cheese and olives are now expensive items. And I'm not even talking of the exported upmarket French cheese or Italian olives. Bread, at least the bread with whole wheat, is even more so. Meat, of course, has been historically expensive. So that is why common people try to stretch it by adding onion, rice, breadcrumbs, spices, and occasionally dried fruit. Oh, shouldn't then I confess that I love stretch meat in the form of dolma or köfte? <laughs> But yes, constraints certainly make you more creative in food, as in life in general. This is a well-known fact by psychologists, but we wouldn't like governments to use such arguments as an excuse for not having poverty reduction policies. Modern time chefs take the old recipes of the poor and give it a fashionable spin. Not that this is new nor unique to Turkey. We once went to a restaurant in Prague where the chefs claimed to use the ingredients used by the locals at the medieval age, namely eggs, root vegetables and salted fish. It was a very creative menu and delicious, but of course we ended up paying a sum that could have fed an entire medieval village. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. There are similar Turkish restaurants that take up Anatolian delights and turn them into upmarket recipes. Chia restaurant, whose founder Musa Dadevran was featured at Netflix Chef's Table, or Neolokal, where Chef Maksut Ashkar gave the traditional Black Sea cornbread or other traditional ingredients, a modern spin. Similarly, popular cafes make the traditional low-budget street lunch, simit and ayran, into a whole menu. They just put a spinach and cream cheese on the simit, the Turkish bagel, and add some mint to ayran, the yogurt drink, and they're done. Or the traditional cuisine of yesterday makes a comeback as the superfoods of today for the health conscious. Suddenly, the staple of Anatolian cuisine, lentils, had returned as the ultimate healthy food, particularly for vegetarians. And when you crave chocolates, have a date instead. <laughs> At least it's better than the exported superfoods that are total strangers to our diet. Blueberries, quinoa and whatnot. Socialite turned cooks who propose healthy recipes of chia seed and almond flour pancakes topped with agave syrup. Come on, I did not even know what agave syrup was until a year ago. <laughs> And then there's the majority who just watch these passionate recipes while economizing on food and chewing on the only food they have in the house, bread, which includes elements 
that doctors warn us to eliminate nowadays. Gluten, sugar, salt and carbohydrates. A healthy table is such a moving feast. I don't even count the different things recommended by different dietitians. When I was in my 20s, butter was untouchable. Now it is exonerated. You cannot have a healthy meal without butter. And even if you're on a strict diet, you must allow for some butter. <laughs> Eating the most natural of activities has become an intellectual dilemma. Should we have two meals or six? Should we have B12 from meat or become a vegetarian and have it from a tablet? Is it morally wrong to eat meat? That's all fine with me, as I come from the Aegean region, where a meal without a few kinds of vegetables and salads wouldn't be considered a meal. But I have friends from other regions, for example, from Southeast Turkey. They couldn't consider it a meal if there weren't a few types of meat dishes on the table. Well, when we speak of Turkish cuisine abroad, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, meat, the döners and kebabs. But largely due to the messes, Turks like to say that the country is a paradise for vegetarians. This may be true for vegetarians, but it is more difficult for vegans. Our habit of putting butter in rice pilav or topping vegetables with yogurt or pastries, which we call börek, rather spoil it for vegans. Plus, we use cheese everywhere. I can go vegetarian, but definitely not vegan. I would never give up on cheese, from the great Malakan cheese of Kars to the Aegean Tulum. What would you never give up as food, again? <laughs> yeah, but before that, let me tell you that your excitement while saying kebab caught my attention. <laughs> and when it comes to me, up until this summer, I would also say cheese, milk and eggs. I love eggs when cooked with fresh chilies, for example. But I started an elimination diet this summer for the first time in my life and it worked. Even though I may have exaggerated the amount of veggies and fruits <laughs> I eat. But yes, I don't think I can survive without them. This summer, my husband, who is a champion for functional medicine and healthy eating, and my sister, who is the director of the Cordon Bleu in Turkey, sharply disagreed on the pandemic's impact on people's eating habits. My husband said the pandemic made people realize that we have to turn to environmentally conscious, healthy food, whereas my sister argued that at times of incertitude, people turn to comfort food, which is mainly carbohydrates and sweets, and far from healthy. Do we know who is right? Well, we know for a fact that people turn to bread making at home and ordered more pasties. In fact, everyone I know complained about putting on weight. So I think my sister was right when she said we crave the familiar. Yes, I suppose one always values the food that evoke good memories. Like Marcel Proust's Madeleine, a bit of flour, sugar, eggs and butter. But this childhood cookie made by his mother was tastier for this great author than everything else he ate at the best tables. So what's your nostalgic food idea? Mine is much healthier, though it's an equally strong image of my childhood. When I was a kid, my father used to go to the Sunday market and come back with boxes of herbs, weeds and greenery peculiar to the Aegean region. We boiled some and mixed nearly all with a special lemon olive oil garlic sauce. The taste but also the smell reminded me of home all my life. It was you who introduced me to ısırgan otu salatası, the stinging nettle salad. It's extremely hard to make because you have to rub it with vinegar to stop the stinging, but I like it so much that I keep struggling to do it. Yeah, you need gloves for that. And can you believe even these greens picked up from mountains have become posh food now? <laughs> what about your nostalgic food? Tomatoes with a bit of salt, but even all alone. I like it as I had in childhood, whole, and warmed by the sun. Mm, it must be delicious. Simplest things give the most pleasure, like sharing. But so often the food is protected by nations rather than generously shared. Take Turkish moussaka, the aubergine dish. Surely, if a Turk sees the way Greeks make it, with minced meat in and cheese on top, would scream out with a loud no! <laughs> and Greeks would say moussaka is their traditional recipe anyway. Still another thing for Turks and the Greeks to fight about. Or like in the Middle East, Palestinians accuse the Israeli of stealing their food. And like the fight over jollof rice among all West African countries from Nigeria to Gambia is not enough, when the British chef Jamie Oliver presented his own recipe for jollof rice, it started an all-out war. Africans came out saying that 
Hmm. We have never eaten jollof with a lemon wedge or topped with tomato. I hope Turks and Iranians don't enter the fight by saying that the word jollof is very similar to pilaf and it is actually their traditional recipe of rice with tomatoes. Oh, was it a mistake to awaken the sleeping giant? Always. I think even bringing peace to the Middle East is easier than getting people to agree whose version of a certain dish is better. For example, which hummus is better, the Lebanese, the Syrian or the Israeli? And who owns baklava? Do you think you can get Turks themselves to agree which city's cuisine is the best? Well, if someone asks me such a tough question, I would simply say that the cuisine by two Turkish cities were recognized by UNESCO as intangible heritage, the cuisine of Gaziantep and that of Hatay. And many others in Turkey also deserve recognition, no doubt. Perhaps the strange thing about the food is we all want to put our own twist to others' recipes, but we don't want others to change ours. Take my mother. For her, her recipes are God-written. She wouldn't cook a dish if one ingredient is missing. Whereas, I never fully follow the recipes. It would be enough for me to have a rough idea about the ingredients. Even when I cook the same dish, I like to change a little bit. Otherwise, I get bored. Your changes are always great, but it depends a little on what the change is. I have recently seen a chocolate baklava in a shop, and I thought it should be forbidden by law. But come on, Aigen, you also like the real thing. You hated those spring rolls in the Chinese restaurant in Ankara. You were saying that they tasted like traditional Turkish pastry, Turkish cigar berry. Well, yes, if you're in a Thai restaurant, you should serve real Thai food. For example, recently, a few friends in Izmir wanted to go to a Chinese restaurant with me, saying that I am more familiar with that cuisine. And with great enthusiasm, I ordered for all of them. But believe me, the typical hot and sour soup didn't have soya sauce, vinegar or chilies in it. So <laughs> it was neither hot nor sour. It was rather like a Turkish chicken soup. Many essential ingredients of Southeast Asia cooking, such as coriander or curry pastes, are not widely used in Turkey. And not only that, but we also see such ethnic restaurants change recipes slightly to cater to Turkish states, like the Chinese spring rolls in Ankara. But tell me, are you a fan of new trends? such as fusion kitchens? Well, there is no escaping from fusion. Even your awful restaurant experience can be labeled as Turco-Chinese fusion. But we did try out molecular kitchen once, and it was worse. As an entree, they brought us two bubbles, both transparent, but one was slightly green and the other slightly white. We chased those slippery bubbles around the plate for a while. When we tasted them, one was salty, the other was very salty. They were molecularly reconstructed green olive and mozzarella. I have never tried molecular food since then. I'm hoping it would go out of fashion, just like the French Nouvelle Cuisine, which as far as I'm concerned, is just an empty plate. <laughs> just the opposite of a full Turkish plate. But there will be lots of new trends, huh? What do you think these will be? Such forecasts keep popping up in my mailbox. And so far, the strangest was that people would turn to eating insects as a source of protein. In fact, I did taste insects dipped in chocolate. It tastes exactly like Rice Krispies. Did I lose some of our audience right here? <laughs> I hope not, but you nearly lost your co-host. So going back to the trends. As people are more concerned about sustainability of the planet and healthy eating, there will be new vegetarian options rather than meats. And in addition to insects, hard cheeses like halloumi of Cyprus will be on the rise as protein sources, according to forecasters. And are there any new trends in dealing with global food waste, particularly related to top-wasted products, bread and vegetables? Yes, it seems that young food companies will bring a solution through clever use of 3D printing. They will combine residual foods, create purees, which then will be 3D printed by a food printer. These will then be baked for a longer shelf life, apparently. Well, this new method may come handy for Turkish food banks, which take crooked cucumbers and food about to expire from markets and then distribute to the people who need it. Such efforts may actually become more necessary since more people are becoming impoverished under the lockdowns. 
The food sector is an important part of the economy and closed restaurants, bars and cafes also mean a lot of people unemployed, putting more pressure on the already high unemployment rate in Turkey. An initiative of Turkish restaurants and catering sector says that the closures since November 20 have left 2 million people without a job. Hopefully, we'll go back to the good old days and have a great meal finished off with a good cup of coffee. Well, hopefully, the future will not be dystopian like George Orwell's 1984. Remember, coffee is a black market item there. <laughs> well, no need to wait for dystopia, maybe. Like everything else, coffee gets more expensive by day. We should definitely discuss coffee, its past, its roots, its connotations, its contribution to conversation in another episode. Yes, see you in another episode of Turkish Coffee. See you next week. Under the spreading chestnut tree, I